Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm happy to help welcome you to this policy forum on negotiating humanitarian access to crisis zones, co-organized with the noted medical humanitarian organization Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, USA. Part of the reading I did in preparing for today's meeting was a chapter in a book published 10 years ago called Paradox of Humanitarian Action, Condemned to Repeat, by Fiona Terry, who at that point was the director of research for MSF in Paris. The chapter was about MSF's work in Central America in the early 1980s, when the guerrilla wars in that region had become a principal theater of the Cold War. I chose it because I had been there then. At the time, I was the New York Times correspondent based in Brazil, and I covered the conflicts that convulsed the populations of Nicaragua and El Salvador, and I ended up meeting, for the first time, the courageous doctors of Médecins Sans Frontières. The MSF website notes that the organization was created in France in 1971 by doctors and journalists. And indeed, the MSF doctors were extremely valuable to us journalists in Central America because they were trustworthy frontline witnesses to the violence. And at that time, they viewed getting the correct information out in public as part of their mission. Now, the, this practice of when to speak out and when to maintain confidentiality has come in for much debate in the years since within F MSF and sometimes led to the kinds of compromises with principles that today's invitation speaks of. One of the places the Central America chapter in Fiona Terry's book talked about was a remote refugee camp called La Virtud, situated at the end of a barely passable boulder-strewn road just inside Honduras, near the country's borders with both Nicaragua and El Salvador. I wrote a story from there in June of 1981, and rereading it this past week, and I realized how it demonstrated the dilemma we will be talking about today. The challenge of negotiating humanitarian access in highly conflicted and politicized environments, and how that tested the impartiality and medical ethics of the international players there, in this case, Médecins Sans Frontières and the United Nations Refugee Agency. Very briefly, the situation was this. Refugees were coming to the camp from both El Salvador and Nicaragua. The Salvadorans were fleeing attacks and in some cases massacres by soldiers of the US-backed Salvadoran government who accused them of being leftist guerrillas. The Nicaraguans were largely right-wing sympathizers of the ousted dictator Anastasio Somoza and many of them were Contras armed and paid for by the U.S. and tasked with going back into Nicaragua and trying to topple the new Sandinista government. The instinct of the doctors and humanitarian workers, of course, was to care for all of the arrivals with impartiality. But they were under intense pressure from the U.S. and its Honduran allies who wanted the Nicaraguans to be treated as freedom fighters and the Salvadoran civilian refugees as guerrilla combatants. Caught in the middle of this standoff, of course, were the humanitarians, the people who, as Susie Linfield, one of our panelists, has written, quote, are looked to not just for their ability to provide medicine and food, but as moral and political arbiters of world crises. Bad as that situation was for the MSF and UN people trying to provide humanitarian assistance in Central America, it was almost quaint compared to what was to come in later years. The crimes against humanity situations with warlords and terrorists and mercenaries and child soldiers and mass atrocities in places like East Timor and Somalia, Sierra Leone, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Liberia, Bosnia, Rwanda, and Afghanistan. 
I didn't experience any of those situations personally, but I encountered them vivid vividly in another piece of reading I did, a compelling article called Aid Wars in the October 2010 issue of The New Humanist written by Susie Linfield. Our panel is a highly experienced and informed trio and since you have their full biographies in your papers, I will just briefly introduce them to you in the order in which they will speak. Sophie Delaunay has been with MSF since 1996 and the executive director of MSF USA since January 2009. Her work with MSF and before that with the French government agency combating AIDS has seen her active with refugees across the developing world and particularly in Tanzania, Rwanda, China, and in the organization's North Korea program. Louis-Georges Arsenault has been overseeing the global UNICEF-supported humanitarian program since becoming UNICEF's director of the Office of Emergency Programs in March of 2008. He previously held ranking positions for UNICEF in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Afghanistan, and Mali, as well as here in New York, where he led efforts to develop a strategic plan aimed at achieving the Millennium Development Goals. His earlier work with Canadian NGOs took him to Togo, Senegal, Morocco, and Burkina Faso. Susie Linfield is the director of the Cultural Reporting and Criticism Program at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute, where she has been teaching since 1995. And she is the author of the 2010 book, The Cruel Radiance, Photography and Political Violence. She has written about politics and culture for a number of well-known national publications, and she is a former arts editor of the Washington Post and deputy editor of the Village Voice. A warm welcome to IPI to all three of you, and Sophie Delaunay, the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks a lot, Warren, for uh, organizing this uh, panel discussion, and uh, to Louis and Susie for accepting to, to be part of uh, this debate. So uh, since I'm the uh, MSF representative on this table, um, I chose to uh, present you the book that MSF released recently, Humanitarian Negotiations uh, Revealed, but not just to present the book because uh, I assume some of you have read it already or uh, uh, will read it in the future, but mostly to uh, make you understand the context and the circumstances in which this book was uh, developed, what are the main findings also and conclusions that we have found while doing this research, and uh, in my view, what I think this reflects about an organization like Médecins Sans Frontières um, when um, reaching uh, these, uh, this sort of conclusion. So uh, initially, this book is, uh, is, is an attempt to bring a different perspective on the issue of what we call humanitarian space. Uh, as you, you all know, in recent years, there has been a, a growing uh, concern uh, from many aid, aid organizations over the possible loss of humanitarian space, what we call the shrinking of humanitarian space. And most of this uh, shrinking was actually attributed to another concept, the blurring of the lines, um, whereby true humanitarian actors could no longer distinguish themselves from uh, belligerents or from uh, other parties to the conflict whose intentions are not necessarily humanitarian, but who, uh, however, decide to provide assistance. And um, when either military or government forces or militants or even private corporates decide to uh, deliver what uh, uh, they call humanitarian assistance, this would create a sort of blurring of the lines and principles, resulting in less respect and less faith in the fundamental principles of humanitarian actions that are uh, neutrality, impartiality, and uh, independence. And these, we assume, the aid community at large, assume that uh, this led to security incidents because, uh, and that therefore to limited access to the beneficiaries and to a reduced ability by aid workers to provide assistance and to operate independently on the ground. So, of course, MSF was no exception to the rule. We also shared these concerns inter internally. 
Um, and uh, particularly because this discussion coincided with a series of dramatic incidents for the organization itself. Since 2008, the organization has been expelled from Niger. Then some sections of the organizations were expelled from Darfur in Sudan. And uh, over the past uh, three, four years, we have faced huge operational limitations in Sri Lanka, for example, during the last military offensive uh, in Somalia and, uh, or in Yemen. And these limitations are uh, precisely described in, in the book. But at the same time, we felt that uh, the, the assertion that our space of work was shrinking was really hard to reconcile with uh, the reality. And the reality is that there's never been so many aid actors, there's never been so many resources allocated to uh, humanitarian action and to global health. So, and MSF again is no exception to the rule. We are now a $1 billion organization. Uh, as we speak, we have 27,000 colleagues working on the ground. We conduct 8 million consultations a year. We deliver 100,000 babies. And uh, so for us, uh, it's, uh, there was, uh, for, for the, my colleagues who started to, to work on this research and to, to write this book, there was a sort of uh, incongruity in stating that our space of work was shrinking. And this is what led to, uh, to this exercise. So what were the, uh, the main findings of, of the book? Uh, through the, these essays, the authors exam examined how and under which circumstances MSF managed to guarantee its space of work. Uh, so they looked at the uh, patient 20 years of medical diplomacy we have conducted in Myanmar, and uh, that allow us to treat 70% of uh, the HIV patients in the country. They looked at how we uh, navigated in the very complex Pakistan environment, how we have managed to reach some uh, tribal areas, how we have failed to have access to Waziristan province, for example. They looked at Afghanistan and how we rebuilt from scratch our acceptance and space of work. And India, South Africa, Yemen, Ethiopia, Nigeria, those are the examples that we've chosen to describe um, in, uh, in countries in which we have conducted some, uh, some difficult negotiations with more or less success. And so the authors review the negotiating process and, and they try to figure out and to describe what has made MSF uh, accept or not certain barriers and certain degrees of compromise. And what this uh, research uh, shows is that uh, there is no predetermined uh, space of work for humanitarian action. There is no what we would call an intangible right uh, of, uh, for humanitarian space that NGOs could claim uh, by virtue of being, being themselves true humanitarian. Instead, uh, there is a space, a space of work that varies according to the crisis and uh, that needs to be gained and to be conquered through negotiation with all the actors. And these ne negotiations, um, the authors try to demonstrate, always involve a degree of compromise on our part also, on the part of the partner, but also on our part. And this compromise can take the form of accepting limited access, and Myanmar, Pakistan, Somalia are examples where we are able to operate, but we're not able to operate everywhere and under every all the conditions we would like. Uh, it can take the form, the compromise can also take the form of accepting to have limited visibility. Uh, India is a good example when uh, we finally managed to open some malnutrition programs, but we had to keep a very low profile, and the program itself needed to keep a, a certain scale. Or even sometimes the compromise went as far as committing uh, to remain silent. And Sri Lanka was the most recent example of um, a balancing act by which we decided to stay and to treat patients and not to speak out. So. Um, uh, another interesting aspect I found uh, in, uh, in this examination of ne the negotiations is that when we're talking about negotiations, we're no longer talking only about state actors. 
There are many more actors you have to deal with when you're operating in the field, of course, non-state actors, but also more uh, increasingly uh, the civil society. And the Indian chapter and the South African one are very good examples of how in order to be able to uh, work on malnutrition or uh, address HIV treatment issues, respectively in India and South Africa, we actually had to convince first the civil society and, uh, and uh, the civil society movements. However, what, what you find in this research is a, is a, persi um, a persistent pattern, and uh, it's that the, the, the way we've managed, and I'm sure it's, uh, it's quite similar with most organizations involved in that field, is that the way you actually manage negotiation is always driven by the benefit that you expect for the patients. Uh, which means that this is precisely what there is, why you cannot define a priori where is the red line. Because the red line is going to be the time when you think that the compromise outweighs the medical benefit that you can have in this country. And given that our medical impact and uh, uh, the level of crisis, the magnitude of the crisis depends from one country to another, then the red line, the red line also uh, is moving. This is why in Somalia, uh, the level of acceptation that we have and compromises is quite higher than in other countries. In Somalia, it's the only country where we ask, accept uh, armed escort, and it's one of the very few countries where we, we conduct what we call remote uh, control programs, where we, we hardly send expatriates um, in the field. Um, there are, so it's a very uh, pragmatic look, I, I think, at uh, how humanitarian organizations, uh, specifically MSF, has conducted negotiations uh, and tried to uh, preserve and uh, implement its principles over the years. Uh, but there are two compromises uh, and two principles that uh, we've tried to keep. And I think that uh, the authors want to show that they are absolutely key, uh, whatever um, the, the other compromise would be. The first one is, of course, the medical ethics. And uh, it makes it easier when you are a medical organization. Uh, when, you, when you're a, a development organization, then you, of course, obey different, uh, different rules. And the second is the independence of judgment. Because without this compromise, then you lose your capacity uh, to define what you believe is acceptable for the organization and, and what is not acceptable. And, and to finish, I'd like to um, uh, reflect a little bit on um, on what it means for, for, for the organization to, to reflect on these issues and what it tells about uh, uh, MSF, who has celebrated last year its 40th anniversary. Uh, first, uh, it's clear that it's not for us, and I hope that the, uh, uh, the public and uh, MSF volunteers who will join the organization in, in coming months will not take this book as a recipe book of how to conduct uh, negotiations. I really hope they won't, because uh, this is uh, not the, uh, the goal of this book. Uh, it shows also that there is no... Uh, historical patterns that uh, defines MSF acceptance or resistance to, to compromise. It's quite the opposite, actually, because uh, MSF approach to, to compromise is actually the result of the lessons learned, of the failures, of the successes of, of uh, past years. And also, um, it, uh, it shows that it has been always carved in the context and the, the, the history when it, when it was happened. In the 80s, MSF was very much... Uh, uh, in a human rights approach, uh, we uh, denounce totalitarian regimes in Cambodia and also perverse effects of aid in Ethiopia. Then in the 90s, we went even further, considering that we needed to take part and position in the political debate. This was Bosnia, Rwanda, where we even called for armed intervention, uh, soon to realize that the remedy might not... Uh, uh, might also be harmful to the population. And the end of the 90s coincided also with a series of uh, clear refusal from MSF to compromise. When we left Goma, 
in Zaire when we decided also to withdraw from North Korea uh, because we, we felt we were strengthening the regime and not reaching the most vulnerable population. And since the 2000s, and this book is certainly the, uh, the result of this uh, decade of reflection, uh, uh, the organization has uh, reaffirmed its neutrality in conflict. We've taken distance from the uh, R2P, the responsibility to protect. We've also distanced ourselves from uh, international justice. Not saying we reject this concept, but claiming that uh, we should not call for, uh, for them and we should not associate humanitarian with these, um, uh, with these theories. So it translated into a much more pragmatic uh, approach and a, and a much more independent and impartial uh, uh, approach. Of course, uh, what remains over the year is the permanent tension between access and ability to operate on the ground and the, the, the willingness to uh, express our outrage, our indignation over what we, uh, what we witness. Uh, but here again, I think the organization is, very, uh, is, is, is staying very provocative. If you take one quote uh, from the, the president of MSF in 1999 when we received the Nobel Peace Prize, James Hobinski, uh, who was referring to the bombing in, uh, in Grozny, Chechnya, because we decided to use the Nobel Peace Prize to actually advocate uh, on this issue. He said, uh, we are not certain by, that by speaking, we will be able to save lives, but we know for sure that silence kills. And now if you open the book and uh, you open the chapter of Fabrice Vesman, who is one research director, he, he decided to adopt a very provocative posture and he says, silence can heal, which is the, uh, the title of his book. So this, uh, uh, this, I think, demonstrates not that MSF was wrong in the past and that now we, we, we're right or, or whatever, but that actually we've always balanced uh, témoignage with action, with a lot of pragmatism and, and certainly a lot of internal debate in, uh, in the organization. So to conclude, um, I, um, I, I would just like to say a few words about the, uh, uh, the comments that have been uh, made about this, uh, this attempt to reflect on humanitarian space. Certainly, uh, uh, it has been uh, um, the, uh, the self-accountability effort of MSF has been praised, uh, and, and it's true that it's a very candid attempt to scrutinize our own practice. But what I think is important is not this, uh, not necessarily this transparency, is really the fact that it's a great opportunity to remind the public, um, and maybe not necessarily this audience because you are aware uh, aware of all the humanitarian issues, but uh, to, to remind the public about the complexity of working in, uh, in such crisis and uh, an environment, and, and hopefully to, uh, uh, to, to, to bring a bit more nuance to, uh, um, to this prob problem and um, a, a bit more nuance to the, the perception of the problems and also to our approach to solutions, because there is a very great tendency to uh, to make humanitarian issues very uh, very blunt. Uh, and I think, lastly, that it helps uh, deconstruct a little bit the, the myth of the uh, humanitarian aid worker, the heroic aid workers, because it pro portrays us, and especially MSF, as, uh, as we, what we are truly. That is, we are parties to the uh, political dynamic of the crisis. Uh, we have our own interests in, uh, in uh, developing these programs. We, are, uh, we have our own interest in also promoting our, our values and and this leads to our own means and uh, limitations thank you warren thank you sophie and i'm sure we have lots of comments i have a couple of questions but before that let's move on to louis george arsenal well first of all thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to speak this afternoon on a subject that is very close to to our heart and i also want to pay tribute to msf for this book which is quite courageous in, in stating some and and also have a uh, an honest discussion about these issues. So we, we really welcome the, the book. And, and uh, for us, UNICEF, uh, I, want, I will mention that a few times, it, we are a very different organization, but at the same time, uh, we are operating also within the same kind of cadre. We are, we are under international humanitarian law. We, have, we are operating under the same principles, even though we are a different organization. And in that sense, if you, if you look at an organization like UNICEF, uh, we are, by definition, an intergovernmental body uh, as part of the system. And, but we are, as I said, uh, um, informed and operating within the same normative 
uh, framework, which is IHL. And I think we can certainly learn a lot from the from from the uh, the lessons learned of MSF over the last uh, over the last decade. So what I want to do over the next couple of minutes is just to look at how we are operating and what we can learn and what are some of the practice that we have had. And it's, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm not going to bring conclusion, but I'd wrap some ideas which differs a little bit from you, which is good. We can have a debate. That's good. Um, what are some of the challenges that uh, that uh, we uh, we are addressing from our standing point, which is, as I said, uh, a, a UN organization and an intergovernmental body by, by, by definition, which, ha which has a, a large mandate in the sense that we are a development agency, as you mentioned. We are also a, humanitarian, a key humanitarian actors when it comes to the UN. And uh, we also have a human rights approach and mandate as, as a UN, and also a very specific approach to children's rights, the mandate to, to children's rights. So some of the challenges that, um, that has been mentioned uh, in the book in the sense of uh, when we are operating in a way that, uh, that uh, when governments are limiting our access, there's also sometimes attempts to instrumentalize, sorry, the, and also the assistance sometimes that serves, that serves a political goal and the counter-terrorist counter agenda are some of the issues that we all have to, to deal with. And I think in the book, um, the, the one of the two examples were Pakistan and Sri Lanka. You mentioned, you mentioned one. In both cases, uh, UNICEF uh, really found itself also having a very, very limited uh, ability to have access mm -hmm. to, uh, to the population. Uh, in fact, in Pakistan, I was there in 2009 uh, during the, the IDP crisis, and uh, our movement was controlled by, by the Pakistani army in, in the affected areas. And in Sri Lanka, our assistance was also directed only to the IDPs uh, regroup under the government established camps. So this is how we were operating uh, on the ground. Um, you mentioned uh, the red lines. And for us, um, we have established, we are establishing some red lines which can be specific and context, can, can be context specific. But there are things we want to, we, we are being pushing in, in, in the high risk environment countries in countries where there are, there are presumptive authorities, government, or very little government capacity. And I just want to mention a few. Um, uh, we did not hand over our supplies to government in questions directly. Uh, we elected to work through NGOs, partners, rather than through government institutions in some instances, and uh, where it was very difficult to, to, to negotiate uh, these, these access. If you look at the, we were back in 2010 uh, during, during uh, the flood, uh, we did not accept the offer. We were part of those who did not accept the, um, which was controversial, of a NATO military asset to deliver assistance, as we thought that we hadn't reached the, um, we hadn't reached the, the principle of last resort and also parties to conflict. This position was not necessarily uh, consensual among the, the various actors. So sometimes we are put in situations which are not, which are not, are not easy. Um, so if you look at some of, some of these red lines, this is certainly not perfect, and uh, our neutrality and the humanitarian assistance provided could be questioned in some instances. But like MSF, we, uh, we are left asking ourselves whether we are being, okay, I apparently have a soft voice. Um, we, are ask, being ourself, we are asking ourselves sometimes the question, how much is it worth it? when we are compromising, but from a UNICEF standpoint, standpoint, we could also say that every child life that we are saving is probably worth it. So there's, there, are, there are give and take there that we need to. Um, uh, this being said, I think it's an important point. Uh, unlike MSF, we do not really have an abstention or an exit option. We are in countries to stay and, uh, in fact, and, and to support government and its people. And we are in countries before, during, and after a crisis or a conflict. That is also part of, of the way we do business. And it's also part of the, the nature of, of who we are. I want to just mention a few examples of extreme uh, situations. And obviously, um, Somalia com comes to mind. And uh, Somalia, especially in Central South, not, not Somalia as a whole, uh, where, as we know, the, the humanitarian imperative is as acute as it can be, and also the operational environment is as complex as it can be. 
Uh, that goes uh, without saying. Um, over the last, uh, over, the, uh, over the years, we have been able to operate in central south on the Al Shabaab control area uh, very much um, through remote programming and also uh, retaining access to national staff at, at all time. Um, and that, was, uh, that will also allow us to continue to, to reach population through partners. And also we did implement two, three years ago a third party monitoring in Central and South where we have limited access. Um, and in fact, we have over the years and we, we're stating what, what is the reality is that we have been maintaining a working level dialogue with the de facto or what we call the presumptive authorities uh, in Central South uh, until 2000, November 2011, like many other people, we were also banned to operate in, in, this, in this environment. And that dialogue that I'm talking about at technical level uh, was focused on access uh, it was and considered and also consisted of explaining why we are doing, why we need to, to continue to support our proposed intervention and also explaining again and again why supply could not simply be an over to the presumptive authorities and uh, why they could not be informed, they could be informed but not involved necessarily in identifying the population that requires the, the support. We had also have several member staff whose daily job was to in fact constantly explain why we could not pay taxes, why, why the aim of humanitarian assistance was. And the humanitarian principles was really what was driving the agenda and also the concept of due diligence meaning that we need to be there to and see from, from ourselves. Was that perfect? Absolutely not. Um, and in fact, I, I can say that despite our effort to monitor and deliver the assistance, uh, the sample of, of the actual, actual size of what we are able to monitor to third party is very small. So there are risks in, in, the, in these operations and uh, given the, 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 the very limited access. Has there been some diversion as well as instrumentalization? Possibly. Uh, this has taken place both, I want to emphasize, uh, on TFG control areas and also Ashabab control areas. And uh, we, but we did, uh, I think we did that consciously that we, uh, we, we ensured that we were also looking at, at both sides of the equation and also trying to increase monitoring as much as possible. Um, Maybe we can have questions if we come back on this. I don't want to, to dwell too much more. Just a couple of more points I want to make is, uh, if we look at context uh, where the, there is an hyper-politicization politicization, uh, in particular protection issues, such as uh, Libya and Gaza, uh, but where speaking out on, on, uh, on human rights and children's rights uh, is, is a critical uh, part of what we need to, be, to do uh, for, for, for children. This is where it becomes a bit more uh, complicated. And uh, Syria is also a case in point uh, in, uh, as, as we speak. So if you look at the, uh, the cast-led operation in Gaza, we had, um, in the beginning, uh, we had considerable discussions internally, the tension between speaking, up, speaking out on, on the abuses, but also being able to continue to have access to, to deliver program. We did speak up a few times, but we also were very nervous in terms of our capacity to continue to operate on the ground. So there's, it, there's a balance there that is very complex, and there's no secret, there's no magic bullet on this one, but I think this is something that we need to, as you said, that we need to continue to, to manage uh, uh, on a daily basis. Um, we are also now, right now facing similar, uh, similar situation in Syria at the moment. Um, if we want to be, uh, if we want to be uh, true to our mandate in, in, in child rights and human, in, in human rights, but at the same time, making sure that we continue to be able to, uh, to be operational as we are in Syria right now. So there's a balance in act that, that is quite critical. Uh, and in Sri Lanka also during, during the war, UNICEF had initially speak up uh, s several times on, on issues affecting uh, rights violation of children. And uh, we were under a lot of pressure, but at the same time, uh, we internally have been confronted to how far we are pushing the envelope on, on this because we, as I said, we are there, we're working with authorities, we're working with various parties. So we have to be able to have a balancing act all, all the time. And as regard the uh, Al-Shabaab in, in, in Somalia, uh, we thought that the point made by MSF was very interesting that uh, 
that uh, noting the fact that MSF never criticized Al Shabaab for its human rights violation for fear of losing access uh, to the zone under their control. So that's an interesting point because um, in, in, the, in UNICEF in the course of 2011 and, and 10 and 11, we did publicize, publicly criticize Al Shabaab for, it, for recruiting and using children in combat. And, uh, but we also uh, re refrain quite a bit in, in uh, having strong denunciation to, uh, after, uh, on the other areas of abuses. So, but we also, one of the few organizations which also denounced TFG for recruitment and using children uh, uh, as, part, as part of the conflict. So a balancing act also, which is not easy. So what to do? And how can we actually do more? Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about the MSF uh, uh, thought-provoking book is that instead, and this is, I think, very interesting, instead of uh, pointing the fingers at external factors, external factors such as the never-ending uh, discussion on integration in human space, uh, or counterterrorism, et cetera, the, the MSF book really encourages us to look at ourselves and how we can make decisions. Uh, to see what is within our reach uh, in terms of staying true to our Martin ideal, while at the same time making uh, the trade-off that are needed to actually uh, achieve results uh, for children. So like MSF, uh, UNICEF probably does choose most of the time the, real, the, realistic, the real, realistic approach we are also driven by pragmatism, and also we need to accommodate sometimes to uh, not to abandon people uh, in need, and also very importantly, uh, not to endanger our national staff, and also preventing from expanding operation, which in many cases is what we we have to continue to do. So, as I was mentioning earlier, the um, of course MSF has the right to abstention; UNICEF doesn't. So we have to operate according to this, to, this, uh, to this very important principle. This is where we differ a little bit. Um, still, I think I'm going to conclude still uh, in a minute. Still, all of us should ask the same questions. Is, uh, as we make these accommodations, what makes us different um, as humanitarian from other aid providers? Is the character of the assistance which reside is in how we do it or if we lose it, do we still have a claim to access? What is the due diligence standard to stay true to humanitarian principles? That is a tough question. And the accountability also to organizations like us, accountability to donors also. Is this something that is being transferred or is there a joint accountability is also an issue that I think is important. And uh, as the MSF book shows, negotiation implies compromise. And uh, so who decides? what compromises are acceptable, and how far can we stretch the Martin ideal before it loses its specific nature are not easy questions to, to answer. And in, concluding, in conclusion, uh, I would argue that the MSF book has come to a perfect time, because this is a kind of decision, discussion that continues to be. It should be de-emotionalized, but also learning from the lessons over the past and also some of the studies, as I was mentioning earlier, the ODI study on integration and humanitarian space as an example. Uh, I want to I want close because I think I've taken a bit of time in terms of the red lines. This is where we think that we should have a conversation on red lines. They will be different and context specific, but some of it, as an example, how much diversion is acceptable in what context and to what aim? How much do we push the envelope? How much monitoring is a minimum acceptable due diligence? In some instances, in some areas where we are, we are involved in large-scale operation, our capacity to monitor is 10 15%. Is that acceptable? Mm -hmm. How can we have a dialogue with our supporters in, into that endeavor? Uh, what are some commonly agreed red lines in terms of engaging with parties to the conflict? Do we end them the supply, uh, let them direct assistance, pay taxes? These are, not small, these are no small questions as well. And what are the trade-offs uh, we should uh, make in terms of speaking out versus retaining access? I think this is all part of the, the core of the matter. Should, in fact, and this is an important point, within the UN and the NGOs, should we actually divide the responsibilities and come together on who can be better placed to do what, speak up, or have access, and so forth. I think it's a very important aspect. So we are all part of a system. 
and a decision on one impact on the other capacity to operate. I think we have to remember that. And uh, we, uh, we may have different operational context, but we all share the objective. And, and also, as I said at the beginning, we are operating within the same normative framework. That is something that we cannot escape. And uh, I do not believe it is just a point of view huh? that is uh, tenable to continue to have these reflections, each agency specifically. And we should probably come together more organized way to have perhaps perhaps some minimum standards that will help us to move forward. So thank you very much. <clears throat> and we will eagerly take you up on the offer of talking about red lines, because as so much of this conversation, red line has always sounded to me like an absolute thing. But you're talking about red lines in a, con in a context, you know, a situational red lines. Just by definition, that means we're into a much more nuanced conversation we normally would be. I think the general public in general, and in comments like uh, what people are saying about Syria right now, people somehow think that humanitarian aid is this lily white thing that operates completely out of a political context, and certainly it doesn't, and certainly your comments are supporting the fact that it does not, and certainly Susie Linfield has written about this, and I call on her now. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I should say that in the late 50s or early 60s, my father worked at the UN as the editor of a publication called the UN Chronicle. He used to take me to the UN when I was a little girl, which I found immensely exciting. So it's a particular pleasure for me to be here today. Since we're celebrating, or at least discussing, the latest book from MSF, and I should say it is a really interesting book that I urge people to read, and an example, I guess, of what the Chinese during the Cultural Revolution called criticism, self-criticism, I wanted to place that book in the context of some other books about humanitarian aid, or the so-called humanitarian crisis, that have come out in the last few years. The background to these books, which include Connor Foley's The Thin Blue Line, some of you may have read that, and Irene Kahn's The Unheard Truth. She was with Amnesty International for many years. The background is several fault. First, with the end of the Cold War, there was, among many leftist social democrats and liberals, a disillusion with what might be called actually existing politics and with the socialist ideal itself, which was now apparently defunct. At the same time, the end of superpower rivalries led to optimistic forecasts about a dawning era of peace and prosperity. For many progressives, humanitarian action came to substitute for traditional political work and to be seen as the only dependably noble, or at least dependably good, cause that remained. One result, and Sophie has alluded to this, was the tremendous growth in non-governmental organizations and the expansion of their duties. And I think that some of the vitriol that is now directed in some quarters against humanitarianism has a kind of God that failed quality to it. Second, there was the emergence of astonishingly brutal, apparently unstoppable, often non-ideological civil wars whose combatants specifically targeted civilians <clears throat> in especially grotesque ways. Vaginal mutilation in the Congo, mass rape in Darfur, amputation in Sierra Leone, kidnappings in Uganda, and the widespread use of children as murderers and sex slaves. I think to call them soldiers is actually a misnomer. They have very little uh, correlation with traditional soldiering. The British political theorist John Keane has turned such conflicts uncivil wars, whose protagonists are beholden to no rules, quote, except those of destructiveness, of people, property, the infrastructure, places of historical importance, even nature itself, unquote. Such wars permanently damage what Keene calls the ecology of human personality and erode the, quote, capacity to act in solidarity with others. Third, as a result of and response to these other factors, there was a great increase in United Nations peacekeeping missions, though often in places where there was no peace to keep. It was hard at the time 
for many activists, journalists, humanitarians, and theorists to understand how interconnected these forces were. In retrospect, though, it is clear that they created a toxic brew, one that thrust the humanitarian movement into what David Reif, in a much earlier book called A Bed for the Night, called, quote, a cognitive and moral meltdown, end quote. There were various way stations on the road to this meltdown. Some of them have been discussed, including Somalia, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Sudan, East Timor, and Afghanistan. But the two most influential were undoubtedly the war in Bosnia and the genocide in Rwanda. And for this audience, I'm sure I don't need to delineate further why those two events were so catastrophic for humanitarians and for that matter for the UN too. The most inflammatory, highly quotable, famous, it, it received a, a very long and surprisingly positive review in The New Yorker, and I think the most irresponsible and misplaced of these books is Linda Pullman's War Games, which was published, at least in this country, in 2010. Pullman is a Dutch journalist who has traveled to many of the world's worst crisis zones. She's knowledgeable and experienced, but the book has a hysterical tinge that we often associate with the betrayed lover. In an interview she gave to the Observer of London, she suggested that some aid workers might be, quote, war criminals. In her book, Pullman castigates humanitarians for living in luxury in the world's most immiserated countries, for frequenting child prostitutes, for using precious aid dollars to buy land rovers rather than build orphanages, for paying off warlords, terrorists, mercenaries, and child soldiers in order to gain access to beleaguered populations. All this is, of course, ugly. But then again, humanitarian organizations operate, by definition, amidst the ugliest conflicts on Earth. It would be odd, indeed impossible, if they did not engage ugliness. This is, in fact, the very topic of MSF's new book. But to the question, what is to be done, Pullman has no answers, or even worse, incoherent answers. For instance, she charges that humanitarian organizations, especially since the attacks of 9-11, and especially in Afghanistan, have abrogated their independence and become stooges of the US military. Spineless is the word she uses. At the same time, she castigates NGOs for their stance of neutrality and insists that they become more political. How to reconcile? Given all this, it is hard to take her demand for a cleaner, purer form of humanitarianism, a humanitarianism without dirty compromises, very seriously. Indeed, her book might be an example of what Lenin called an infantile disorder. Yet I focus on her book because I think that, in her anger, her disappointment, and her confusions, she represents much wider tendencies that are shared by many people, and especially by the public at large, maybe not by people within the, the humanitarian world itself. Pullman also claims, and this is something that my friends at MSF have also argued, though in a much more thoughtful way, that the Taliban and other so-called insurgent groups have targeted aid workers because humanitarians are seen as collaborators, that's Pullman's loaded word, collaborators with a foreign occupation or with imperialist powers. Perhaps there is some truth to this. But then again, taking the Taliban, the Taliban have targeted an awfully wide range of native Afghans, including teachers, doctors, journalists, lawyers, feminists, secularists, women of all sorts, farmers, market goers, shepherds, adulterers, and schoolgirls. All of these extremely disparate people are apparently infidels, or if you prefer, collaborators, who it seems are eminently worthy of death. I suspect, therefore, that the connection to the US military is not, in fact, the source of the attacks on aid workers. In my view, 
the attacks on humanitarian workers are not mainly due to supposed ties between the U.S. or other militaries and NGOs. Rather, these attacks are part of a larger international attack on the entire concept of the civilian. And I would add that deliberate attacks on journalists and photojournalists, which we're seeing more and more, are a result of this same ideology. We've seen this erasure of the civilian again and again, though it never ceases, at least in my mind, to shock. Whether it's al-Shabaab murdering soccer fans watching the World Cup in Uganda, or killing young Somali doctors at their school graduation, death squads in Iraq, both Sunni and Shia, murdering unarmed civilians in hospitals, marketplaces, even mosques, the increasingly widespread and, incre and increasingly grotesque mass sexual assaults on women. One recent study published in the American Journal of Public Health estimated that an astonishing two million Congolese women and girls have been raped and the use of children as killing machines and sex slaves. No matter how neutral or independent humanitarian organizations are, and I know that MSF strives mightily for that independence, aid workers will, I fear, continue to be attacked. The denial of the whole category of the civilian is, I think, a kind of civilizational devolution that we are witnessing and humanitarian organizations are, alas, on its front line. Thank you. Um, Susie, let me ask you one something and Sophie something. Uh, just on that last point you were making, if indeed um, attacks on humanitarian workers are not really tied to their association with a government or not ideological, but really are attacks on those workers, attacks on civilians. What's the answer? Does that, uh, do humanitarian workers have to do what MSF did in Somalia, where you actually agreed to have armed escorts? Is that the answer? Uh, Sophie's probably better at answers than I am, and I think she probably disagrees with me. I know that a lot of people at MSF disagree with my analysis of this. But uh, you know, an, another example of that is was which I don't need to remind this group of was the uh, uh, demolishing of the UN headquarters in Baghdad. I'm not saying that the attacks on humanitarian workers aren't connected to that, but I don't think they are as centrally connected as as many uh, as certain theorists have put forth, and certain even certain people on the ground. Um, I, I don't think it's possible to view the murder of aid workers, view the murder of UN people, et cetera, without looking at it within the wider context of the murder of all sorts of ordinary civilians and the defense of the murder of all sorts of ordinary civilians as a great revolutionary act or a great religious act. So I, 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 I question whether the attacks on aid workers can be separated from what I see as this larger uh, assault on civilians in general. And Sophie, I want to ask you about uh, in Sri Lanka, where you said the MSL felt it had to maintain um, basically a vow of silence. It would go silent. What happens in a situation like that when, after the fact, the United Nations comes along, as it did, and investigates that situation and obviously needs evidence and information that those doctors would have? Are they still bound at that point by confidentiality not to say what they know? Well, first, uh, the, the, the primary mandate of MSF when we're in the field is to provide the medical care. So we don't feel that our first responsibility is actually to investigate or to speak out about the, uh, the violence. And so, uh, and there is no um, sort of confidentiality rule either. There is a decision making at a point of time. Uh, not to speak out publicly because 
we know we're going to be denied access at a time when we can make a huge difference from a medical standpoint. And this is what happened in Sri Lanka during the time when we uh, uh, clearly the, we had to, uh, to, to sign a provision in the MOU with the Sri Lankan government that uh, we would not speak out or criticize publicly uh, the, the government. And that was a time when uh, we were running extremely relevant medical care. This being said, uh, we've, we've spoken out, we've uh, described in the chapter uh, all the uh, outrage that the team was, uh, uh, was feeling and we've continued to describe the nature of our program, hoping also that by demonstrating the level of medical needs, you indirectly testify about the level of the violence. So I don't think there is a, a sort of confidentiality. And, uh, um, and what you have to know is that actually, when, when you make a decision, there has to be a decision made at some point in the organization that is usually made by the leadership and the operations. But it doesn't mean that the organization is fully um, consensual. Certainly not. I personally uh, still feel very uh, bitter uh, about the position and the compromise that we had to make in Sri Lanka. And uh, Louis, I want to go to the audience in a second. Louis George, just one question of you. You've been in this field of work now for a long time. Um, is what we're talking about uh, the need to make compromises, grant concessions, whatever, to preserve access, even if it might violate some fundamental principle your organization has. Is, is that getting worse, or is, is there more and more of that that you, you and your agency have to confront now than before? It's a very good question. I think the, it's probably fair to say that there is a um, a complexification of the uh, some of the conflicts that we are dealing with, and it's not the number of conflict; it is the, the, the complexity of the situation. I don't. I would suggest as the first, and if I can link that question to the other point, um, I, I lived about 18 years in West Africa before some time ago, and um, I'm following very closely the event right now in West Africa, obviously, and it's difficult for us to say that uh, there is not a link directly to what we represent as the values that we carry as, as a UN agency, as an example of where we were hit badly in Abuja a few months ago, uh, and we lost several people. And th the message was that we were a soft target and that we were, being, we were under attack because what we represented in terms of values according to those who claim the, uh, the, uh, the terrorist attack. I also live in Mali for several years, and Mali right now is a very different situation. And uh, we, could, we, could, we could, as UN, we could travel, walk, horseback, everywhere in the country. This is not 2,000 years ago. This is a decade ago. Right now, I don't think we can do that. And we, we can become a target because of a different agendas that are also spreading in that part of the world. So I think while I recognize that there is a... Um, I recognize that there is also, as you mentioned in Afghanistan, the attack is widespread and kids are being killed also and being used also as, as, a, as a weapon of war uh, by, by, the, by, by the Taliban and so forth. But I think there is also a direct targeting. I'm part of those who believe that the neutrality and the security provided by the blue flag is not what it has been in the past. Um, I'd like to get some comment and questions. If you would just raise your hand. Uh, We'll start there, and then secondly with Dirk Solomon. Is there a third hand? Because we'll do three questions in one. It's good in the back. If you wait for the microphone, and let me just tell you one thing. We are webcasting this, which means you have to hold the microphone quite close to your mouth and very steady. Thank you. Okay. Please identify yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, George Andreopoulos from the City University of New York. Um, my question is directed to Ms. Deloney, and first of all, I want to thank Medicines from Frontier for coming up with this book that will provide a lot of thought, uh, a lot of food for thought, as well as discussion. I would like to ask you to comment on one of the most fascinating chapters of this book that you alluded yourself in your comment, the one by Fabrice Weissman, Silence Heals. In his concluding uh, paragraph, he says that Medicines on Frontier have moved from 
attachment to neoconservatism in the 70s and 80s to liberal interven interventionism in the 90s. Now, there is some overlap in these frameworks. Now it's time to distance ourselves from all these and also distance ourselves from our traditional allies on the ground, UN and human rights groups. So here are my questions. First, does distancing means total rejection of these frameworks? And you alluded yourself also to a, to a distancing from an offshoot of what of liberal internationalist R2P and the international criminal justice mechanism. Second, can you elaborate a little bit what are some of the new actors which you will try to form alliances on the ground if you are distancing from or some of your traditional partners. And um, to what extent, uh, what will be the guiding principles on which you will form such alliances? Because you alluded to a couple in your presentation. You alluded, for example, to the importance of independence of judgment, medical ethics. And of course, you highlight also the fact that all this has to be contextualized. But still, there must be some guidance principles. What will this consist of in addition to what you mentioned? And could any of these frameworks that you are distancing yourself offer any insights as guiding principles for such partnerships. Thank you. Uh, Dirk Solomons. Thank you, Dirk Solomons, Columbia University. There's a question for Mr. Arnaud. Arnaud. Um, UNICEF has a very clear identity of its own and is seen as somewhat uh, individually separate from the UN system. On the other hand, you have strong pressure now delivering as one uh, UN Development Assistance Framework uh, to integrate UNICEF into this broader concept of the UN. That means that you are now more and more being seen as part of a system that not only has values, but also political opinions defined by the Security Council. When you go into Somalia, the Security Council has defined who the good guys and the bad guys are. Uh, how does it affect your ability to work um, under that aura of independence and neutrality? Uh, how can you reconcile being identified with the Security Council's profiling and your own standards? And in the back of the room. Thank you very much. Uh, Marwan Jilani, International Federation of the Red Cross. Uh, one sort of comment question and, and the question, I think maybe uh, Louis George alluded to that, and that is the division of roles and responsibilities. And I think it, or different organizations have different missions. Some organizations have their mission to speak out, to investigate, and even to link and demand international justice, while others, their core mission is to reach those who are affected by, by the conflict, and that is their, their core mission. So uh, I think some of you speakers have alluded to, to, uh, to that. So that maybe uh, is a way to address that dilemma. But my, other, my question relates to the, in this uh, research that MSF do, uh, does and in the work uh, that the panel have been engaged in, would you say that there has been a pattern to draw some conclusions as to the determinants of acceptance. Uh, for example, status of organization, like my, the previous question related UN and the UN links to Security Council, to, to the political decisions of the UN, other organizations who could be seen as more independent, pure humanitarian mission, uh, the, the, the broad program, the assistance given to all, uh, the ability to engage with state actors, non-state actors, and so, and so on. Uh, I think even within the UN system, we have seen that some organization may be allowed in the same context, while others are not allowed. So is, is there a conclusion that we can draw uh, in relation to the principles of, of humanitarian action? Thank you. Um, Sophie, I think if you could take that first question, and we, George, uh, the next two seem to be directed at you. And Susie, I'll call on you at the very end to see if you have some comments to make on those questions. All right. So um, 
The question about Fabrice's uh, chapter, where well, I actually learned a lot in this chapter. I didn't know that MSF, was cre uh, when it was created, actually had a provision of confidentiality. We usually say that we were born out of uh, uh, our outrage and wanted to distance ourselves from, uh, from the Red Cross, but apparently uh, it was not the case. Uh, so um, you're right, there's been a, a gradual trend, and what Fabrice described is not a statement by the organization, it's, a, it's an observation of how we have gradually uh, evolved. And there is a, there's been a distancing from uh, uh, a series of uh, political stance. It doesn't mean we distance from the reflection. It doesn't mean we don't talk to others. It doesn't mean we don't work with others. But we, uh, we have gradually realized that uh, we don't think it's healthy to be uh, closely affiliated or associated with some specific organizations or with some concept. And this is why the, uh, uh, we've distanced ourselves from the responsibility to protect. We feel it's not, and it's even harmful for humanitarian aid to call for uh, R2P for military intervention. Uh, it, it doesn't mean total rejection. Uh, clearly not, and um, it's been a, a different way of operating uh, on the ground. In 2006, we actually conducted a, a self-criticism <laughs> review again on our relationship with the aid system. And uh, this review led to the conclusion that we should actually engage differently with the aid system. And it was not by being part of alliances, coalitions, platforms, etc., where we considered we uh, were using a lot of resources for very limited added value for our operations, uh, but that we should engage in a targeted bilateral discussion with some specific uh, actors. And this is what we've been doing since 2006. And actually, uh, in the room, there are my colleagues from this uh, unit uh, who are very regularly in contact with uh, UN partners, other NGOs, we, with government involved. And actually, we've never been so much in contact with, uh, with the aid system. It's just that it's more targeted. And, uh, and for us, it's more helpful to conduct our, oper our operations, because there there is a goal and a purpose for every conversation. Uh, and it also um, comes, it's a bottom-up initiative. Um, every action we would have toward the partners, including in New York, actually comes from operation. It's not a willingness from the top to build a coordination system or, or a, an alliance. And then, uh, what would be the sort of your, your third question about uh, how would we form alliance or partnership? Uh, and I, I assume it's uh, in the field, right? You're talking about. Uh, and what would be the guiding principles for that? Yes, definitely, there could be. Uh, and we are actually uh, collaborating with a lot of organizations uh, in the field. The purpose would be the first guiding principles will certainly be operational. That is, is there an operational added value, complementarity being one, when Oxfam can ensure the sanitation, uh, we are more than happy uh, to leave it to them so that we can focus and, uh, and, and devote our resources on uh, on medical care. I think that uh, it, uh, there is also almost systematically and more and more uh, as we work less and less in failed states, there is a very strong partnership with the Ministry of Health, not just about defining the scope of our intervention, but also trying to uh, improve medical protocols, practices, etc. And the third aspect uh, or guiding principles in, uh, in our intervention would be actually depending on the context. Uh, if you are operating in a context, in a context uh, which is not in a conflict crisis, which is less politically loaded, uh, it makes much more sense for us to collaborate with authorities, including with the military. When you have to respond to, to, to floods in China, uh, needless to say that the Chinese military are much better equipped than MSF to do so, and our added value is very much epidemiologic or very, uh, very targeted. Whereas in conflict situation, there is a high risk of being associated, of affiliation, of changing the perception and our ability to gain acceptance. And in these circumstances, we would be less reluctant to collaborate uh, with state actors. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, very close to you. Thank you for the question. I mean, obviously, uh, I'm stating the obvious. UNICEF is part of a system that is governed by member state. So we are part of a system that has its complexity. 
But I would venture to say that uh, we do also maintain a voice specific for children. And we are doing this by ensuring that we maintain as much as possible a neutrality in speak and engaging with all parties to a conflict, all parties to a conflict. And also when it's time to speak up to all parties who are, who are also um, um, uh, cause violation on children, the example I gave to, uh, earlier on Al-Shabaab and TFG. We, we spoke, we voiced our concern to both. So, and this is a, a prerogative that UNICEF will continue to maintain as part of a system to voice its concern when it comes to major abuses of children. And it may be part of the system, but it may be independent as an agency. But we also want to work with the system, but sometimes we have to work as the mandated by, by the, the, the CRC and so forth. And one of the most important aspects, I think, is also what uh, you were mentioning uh, is uh, the, uh, the concept of acceptance. For us, we are able to continue to operate in all of these areas because we are able to maintain a dialogue with, with the communities over time, over years, and also by demonstrating our impartiality to be able to, to talk to all parties concerned and also by being present to continue to deliver to the people. And that is part of the acceptance. So I think it's an important aspect also of a specificity, which is not an attribute to the whole system necessarily. Um, I can certainly see why a humanitarian group or a UN agency might not want to be aligned with a particular Security Council uh, resolution or with a particular uh, policy of the US government. Um, but I'm somewhat confused, and this gets to the first gentleman's question, by the what seems to me a very strenuous effort by MSF and also by some other, David Reef has written a lot about this, a very strenuous effort to completely separate humanitarian aid from human rights. Um, it seems to me that the, the most basic, if, if humanitarian aid has any basic principle, and you can tell me if I'm right, um, and also if the UN has any basic principle, it's that every life is worthy of defense and of nurturing and of existing, um, regardless of politics or race or gender or ethnicity or religion, et cetera. That that is what humanitarian aid represents. And that is an assertion of human rights. And there are many places in the world where that principle is, in fact, quite contested. So I'm not exactly sure how it is that MSF or any aid organization can completely dissociate itself from basic human rights precepts. I understand the complications of being aligned with particular political positions, but I think that's very, very different from trying to completely disentangle yourself from, from principles of human rights. Good, I have a question in the second row, and anywhere else? And over that side, good, I've got three questions. We'll do three again at once and answer them all together. Yes, Catherine Dumais Harper, former MSF. Um, my question is to Sophie, if she could uh, reply to Mrs. Linfield's comments on the, the attacks you know, on humanitarian aid, for example, by the Taliban. In my own experience with MSF, I know that we were able to work for 25 years without interruption in uh, Afghanistan. Only a few years ago, we have to pull out because they killed some of our colleagues. And at the time that the Taliban were in power in Kabul, I was visiting the team. And actually, I was very surprised to see the Taliban were respecting very much the organization. All our expatriates at the time post in Kabul were women, except for the head of mission. So I would like perhaps Sophie to bring her own thought about uh, your comments and your question. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Doug Hostetter with the Mennonite Central Committee. And I've spent a lot of time working with the Mennonite Central Committee in quite a number of conflict zones around the world. And I very much appreciate the uh, position that MSS has taken on this and trying to find the humanitarian space um, and to insist on neutrality and impartiality. I think the elephant in the room is that 
after Samuel Huntington and the clash of civilizations and September 11th and the war on terrorism and the war on Islam, uh, there's been a major division of the world. And very often the non-government organizations have been used as a part of the psychological warfare effort in this war. Uh, and it's a conflict between the East and the West in a lot of places. And even, and that makes it very difficult, especially for those of us who are trying, who are neutral, but we are also Western at the same time. Um, we want to do humanitarian work, but we also um, want to disassociate ourselves from uh, the uh, war of the West on the East uh, and try to, I think probably the most important thing and the reason why um, we also reject R2P is we are we're pacifists and like the Hippocratic Oath, the, uh, con the commitment is first to do no evil or do no wrong. Um, and to use war as a way of solving a human rights problem, um, my experience at having spent a lot of time on the ground in war zones is not a very good solution to this. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing, and I hope you keep it up. And finally, the last question. Thanks. Um, I'm Devin Curtis from the University of Cambridge, and I also have a question mainly for, for Sophie. Um, one of the criticisms of humanitarianism in the 1990s and 2000s that I found most sort of troubling and difficult really was, were criticisms that had to do with the whole notion of humanity and of acting on behalf of humanity. And some critics would say, well, we can't even talk about humanity that's independent of systems of power. And that even in the whole humanitarian system, when you have predominantly white aid workers from Western countries encountering um, people that they were labeling as victims rather than as political agents, or these sort of white, mostly Western humanitarian actors as sort of saviors and victims, and that this was, was deeply problematic. And I was really intrigued by, by your presentation, and it seemed as though part of what MSF is, is doing then is going beyond this, or saying that actually um, MSF itself is a political actor, and that those, in, instead of thinking of people as victims whose lives must be saved, um, we need to think about people as political agents. And I'm just wondering if I'm over-interpreting what, what you're saying, or if that indeed is, is where MSF is, is going. Thank you. Panel, we'll answer that with Sophie first, Louise yours last, and second, and then the last word will come from Susie. Go. So, um, I need to answer to Catherine's uh, question about the ethics, and uh, the attacks, and maybe to link into the uh, issue uh, that Susie raised about whether or not the affiliation uh, with some uh, uh, political groups is actually uh, threatening or weakening our uh, our ability to to work. I think that uh, I'm convinced personally, and I think that the organization, uh, generally speaking, is convinced that in order to build acceptance, uh, we absolutely need to try to uh, uh, demonstrate on the ground uh, our uh, our neutrality and impartiality. And uh, one way to do that is definitely to. Uh, you know, uh, try not to be affiliated with some parties to the conflict. And uh, honestly, the fact that we are not seeking uh, US government funding is of great help in uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. It's almost the first question that is being asked to the team when we start to engage with community leaders and so on. So it's not a silver uh, bulletproof jacket, but it is uh, it is helpful. And being seen as affiliated is sometimes not helpful at all. This being said, there are many reasons to be attacked that uh, we have a hard time to analyze most of the time. Uh, in 2009, two of our Pakistani colleagues were uh, caught in a, in, a, in a fighting, in a crossfire, and uh, we, we believe we were not targeted. Uh, but uh, the result was about the same for the organization, and we had to suspend 
depend uh, activity for uh, for some time. Um, so you can be uh, it can you can be uh, attacked by accident because we are working in areas that are extremely uh, dangerous and there is no zero risk. Um, or you can also be targeted because you are not, it's not that you are targeted, but you are not able to distinguish yourself and to build this acceptance. And the assassination of our colleagues in Afghanistan uh, is actually a demonstration of that. It was not that we were targeted, but they knew who we were. And obviously, we didn't manage to convince them of uh, our good faith, and which is you know, a slightly uh, more nuanced uh, understanding. And as long as we were not able to rebuild this acceptance in the Afghan communities, we didn't resume operations. In most, in most, in most operations throughout the world, we have been able to maintain and not be a direct target building on what I said earlier in terms of uh, trying to, ma to maintain uh, uh, impartiality and neutrality as much as possible and also engaging with, uh, with uh, our parties and also uh, the acceptance at community level. But we have also been targeted in several countries where we are associated to a broader agenda. That is also a fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we have, I have lost people I knew in some countries which were just happened to be with the broader system at the wrong place at the wrong time and they lost their life. So that is also part of the reality. And Susie? I'm not sure exactly uh, which question to address. I, I guess um, in the, the uh, University of Cambridge um, student, I see the sort of the ghost of Foucault raising its head in your question about uh, power relations, et cetera. I mean, yeah, there are people in the world have very, very, very different degrees of power, absolutely. Um, humanitarians tend to work in places where people have been deprived of almost everything, including power. Um, and I guess in some sort of abstract way, one can say, yes, everyone is a political actor, but I think that that in a way is a sort of romanticization. What you're dealing with precisely is people who have been often robbed of their land, of their homes, of their families, of their children, of their livelihood, of food, of water, of health, of life itself. So to romanticize them as, as powerful political actors, I think says more about our need um, to view people in certain ways or our guilt about having more power than it does often about people in situations that humanitarians actually aid. They may at some point regain those things. They may even live in a society where they do have political power, but at every moment, not everyone is endowed with that. Seeing no more hands, we're just about at the end of time anyway. Um, I want to thank all three panelists for your contributions, for coming here today. Thank you all for your attention. Bye-bye.